We will break the back of the energy crisis. We will lay the foundation for our future capacity to meet America's energy needs from America's own resources. 1974 must be the year in which we organize a full-scale effort to provide for our energy needs, not only in this decade, but through the 21st century. It will require sacrifices, but it, and this is most important, it will work. Bluntly, I must remind you that we have not made satisfactory progress toward achieving energy independence. Energy is absolutely vital to the defense of our country, to the strength of our economy, and to the quality of our lives. Such vulnerability at present or in the future is intolerable and must be ended. <clears throat> Our excessive dependence on foreign oil is a clear and present danger to our nation's security. And here we have a serious problem. America is addicted to oil, which is often imported from unstable parts of the world. For more than 30 years, we've been hearing that this is a problem. Why hasn't something been done? America is more dependent now than ever on foreign suppliers of energy. Is there any solution to this problem? If there is, why hasn't the problem been solved? I mean, given all the technology we have in this world, it's remarkable that we haven't had an alternative uh, to the combustion engine or an adaption to the combustion engine that makes the petroleum last longer. And many have long thought that oil companies have bought up patents to allow them to continue to make more money. No one's proven it. If technology exists to improve gas mileage, why hasn't someone seen it? The man came to the airfield one day with a 1946 Buried Roadmaster. He had invented a carburetor that was water injected and could get close to 100 miles per gallon. He told us that Shell Oil Company had bought the patent from him, which made him a millionaire. Shell told him he could keep the one on this Buick, but could build no more. Now, the Buick Roadmaster was a very heavy car. Can you imagine what that would save on the lightweight cars of today and our energy consumption? I couldn't tell you. Because this is really just a gimmick to us. You know, we didn't think anything could ever come of it. Buick Roadmaster. Curb weight, 4,465 pounds. Hummer H3. Curb weight, 4,700 pounds. The Roadmaster weighs almost as much as a Hummer. What if a Hummer could get 100 miles to the gallon? Did Shell Oil really bury this technology? They've done a pretty good job covering it up. People who've looked haven't been able to find those patents on the record. In 1946, a man living within 20 miles of Modesto, California, where Ken Cundy raced cars, registered this patent. This particular device is a very simple concept that takes water and humidifies it and allows that humidified air to be drawn into a carburation system such as an internal combustion engine in an automobile. Conceptually, I can see it does a few things. When you add humidity to the air, it allows the thermal properties of the air to cool the engine and make a more even combustion process, which prevents pre-ignition. And that's one of the claims in the patents, so. It may readily be seen that with a device of this kind, higher compression ratios can be utilized materializing more power and fuel economy and also permitting the use of lower grade fuels. That alone is a big improvement uh, in the efficiency of an engine. We all have had the knock in our automobiles before, and so this reduces that. It can also increase power, I believe, by allowing you to use a lower octane gas or just increase your torque, either one is possible. So I see fuel economy opportunities with this. Why don't we know about this technology? Why? <laughs> I, that's, what, that's the question I'm asking. And 
why I wrote the letter. I said, what happened to that? And who would you call if you had this idea? Would you call shell scientists? What if they had a laboratory less than 10 miles from your house? Here at the Agricultural Laboratory near Modesto, California, it's a modern laboratory, complete to the last detail. The old shell building still exists today. The inventor's son was originally excited to participate in this film, but will no longer return our phone calls. In 1977, the book Fuel Economy of the Gasoline Engine, which was published by the Shell Oil Company, documents that Shell scientists were able to achieve 149.95 miles per gallon on a 1947 Studebaker. This book is out of print and has disappeared from the Library of Congress. Here are the pages. The Shell Oil Company would not talk to the filmmakers, but in February of 2007, they were able to interview a retired Shell scientist living in England. My name is David Blackmore, and I'm, I worked for quite some years in Shell research. I edited the book called Fuel, Fuel Economy of the Gasoline Engine. Uh, and we normally would test our fuels in real or, or sometimes prototype vehicles and engines that uh, we would have uh, contact with with the, with the motor industry, the motor manufacturers. It began um, uh, in one form or another 60 years ago, just before World War II, 1939. Our race to see how much gasoline we need to run our car one-fourth of a mile. During the first vehicle just before the war, I think uh, that particular one uh, um, was in fact a converted vehicle from a, a road vehicle at the time, and I think that first one was uh, something like 49, 50 miles per U.S. gallon. Um, when the specials began, it was um, they managed to get into the hundreds of miles per gallon, but there was still some quite excitement in a few years before the 1,000 miles per gallon barrier was broken, which I think didn't happen until the late 1970s. What have we been doing while scientists have been getting 1,000 miles per gallon? <laughs> the gas prices back in those days were probably around five cents per gallon, and the goal was to sell as many gallons as possible. So if, if Shell, the Shell Group, had their capitalistic hat on, they want to sell as much of it as they possibly can. And maybe nothing else mattered. I don't know their corporate ethics. This article in the paper about a gentleman named Tom Ogle down in El Paso, Texas, and he invented a car that would get 100 miles to the gallon. And so I was really interested in this idea. So I read this article and it showed a picture of his car. And the more I read, the more interested I got in what he was doing. So I had an old 72 Pinto sitting in the backyard. And I said, you know, I'm going to try this thing. So I took this 72 Pinto and got myself a propane tank for my little project. So I took the propane tank and took it to a guy and had a chamber put on the bottom like Tom did with his. One thing you have to understand, the only thing that makes a cylinder pop is vapor. When you run a carburetor, the only thing that makes a cylinder pop is vapor. When you run fuel injection, the only thing that makes that engine run is vapor. It's whatever vaporizes in that cylinder under pressure that burns. Raw gasoline will not burn. If you flood a car, you can't get it started. And it's got all the gasoline in the world in it. So if you only put vapor in the cylinder, you're going to get 100% burn. And so Jim bought all the parts, anything he needed, and uh, to go on there. So that tank was pressurized to such a point and, and also heated. You had a certain amount of heat and, and the pressure. And the two together caused the, uh, nothing but vapor to go in for the, for the burning. And so that's, that's what he got 100 miles per gallon by that. On the day uh, of the trial to run this thing out to see what the actual mileage would be, Jim Peck gave me a call and said, uh, Wiley, come on out to the uh, shop and bring your car. And we're going to Deming, New Mexico, on a test run. Before we left, they drained all the gasoline out of this uh, car, went across the street with a, ta with a little can, got two gallons of gasoline, and brought back and poured it in there, and did this right inside the shop. One of Jim Peck's drivers drove my car, and we, we followed Tom Ogle in his, this uh, car. That thing would run, too. That thing would uh, 
we, we had to kind of step on the gasoline to keep up with it. So we went to uh, Deming, which was 100 miles from El Paso, and we made an exit there over to uh, Holiday Inn, stopped and went in. We all sat around a little round table there and had a cup of coffee, and while we were there, well, several people came in for our autographs and, and so forth, and then after we left there, we came back to, uh, got as far as El Paso, and uh, it ran out of gasoline right just about the center of, of this city. So we checked it out, and it, it, it still came to just a, just a fraction over 200 miles that we had made with two gallons of gasoline. After that fateful trip to New Mexico, Tom became a local celebrity. Not only does Ogle's car promise more miles per gallon, but he says it will clean the environment. I've had the oil companies try to buy my unit with the agreement that I'd never build another. I refused to sell, and the only thing they had left was to try and break me in court. So it makes, makes you kind of wonder how they got to him and got, and got that thing, if, if, if he felt that way, but... Uh... Eventually, Tom found a company in Washington that he felt would take his invention to market. They claimed that they were going to take it up to their place, and they had the sh uh, technicians and, and everything that, that was going to refine that thing, you know, up to a better point than what it was. His was sophisticated enough to get him dead. <laughs> After his Oglemobile was taken away, Tom was found dead in his car. According to an investigator, his death was due to alcohol and an apparent overdose of the drug Darvon. You know, I'd come home on the weekend and it had gone up another 25, 50, 65 cents a gallon. There was a lot of complaint that prices went up excessively after the hurricanes. Uh, as you stated, that Exxon had record profits uh, over that time period. The more crude they own and the less they have to buy, that does generate some very serious profit. Before Katrina, every time we raised a problem with the gasoline prices, the oil industry always said, oh, it's the world price of crude oil. We've got to pay $78 a gallon. It intuitively made sense, even though they weren't paying those prices. They had their own crude oil operations. I can see how people might look at that and be suspicious. The news media is fabulous for the oil industry. They might as well buy the news stations and run them. Presented as a public service by Standard Oil Company.